Shall we get crazy with this one? Let's start a print right at the beginning of this review. This printer is genius. Wow, right? It's extruding, it's printing right now. Ah, oh, absolutely amazing. You know, I recently had a friend contact me and ask me if he could use a couple of my 3D printers for a project he was working on. And I was like, dude, how many 3D printers do you think that I have? And he's like, well, you're reviewing them all the time. Fair point. But the thing is, I don't always keep all of the 3D printers that I review. Sure, I keep a couple of them, especially if they increase my ability to make, if they provide a tool or service or some sort of functionality that other printers don't have. And for some 3D printers that I review, I they're just not worth even passing on to somebody else. But for a lot of them, for many of the 3D printers that I review, if they're good, if they're solid, I pass them on to somebody else who I know is going to give them a good home. I know is going to use them well and do amazing things with them. I kind of, basically my thought is, build up 3D printing in your area. And so anytime I unbox a 3D printer, I'm always wondering what the ultimate fate of that 3D printer is going to be. And yes, for the artillery genius, I was wondering the same thing. Now the unboxing experience was actually super interesting because I cracked open the box and saw this not insubstantial manual staring me down and I thought, oh man, well, this is going to take me a little while. So I turned on Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album and started to put this printer together. But much to my surprise, I barely got through the first track before I was done putting this thing all together. And that was with even needing to remove the screws that held up the Z gantry because I forgot a lock nut on them. Yes, this thing goes together very quickly. It's not a kit, it's just a simple stand things up, bolt them together, and plug the motors in. Took almost no time to get set up. So, what's with this huge manual? Well, turns out most of it is different languages. They've got the English instructions, they've got Chinese, they've got Deutsch, Espanol, French, Italiano, e Ruski. So, yeah, it's all languages, and really the only part of the manual that matters is just this little bit here. Putting it together is just barely three pages, and then the next page is all about... Pronter face? Seriously, Pronter face is what you recommend? It's not even a slicer. Why do you recommend people use Pronter face for this machine? I mean, you know that Cura already has a profile set up for this machine, ready to go within itself. You just have to select it. I mean, never mind, you have to use an old version of Slick 3 or in the background of Pronter Face. And don't at me, my generation invented Leet Speak. I know how it's supposed to be, but you don't get to name a slicer. Slicer, that's just ridiculous. Slick 3 or deal with it. Well, uh, that's not, too big a deal. Besides, you know, there are always test prints on the card that we can use. Why don't I print one of them? Oh, there are no test prints on the card. And there's no filament in the box to do your first test with, even if they had test prints on the card. Fortunately, I had this spool of matte blue filament from my friends at Fulament. And this filament is absolutely beautiful. I don't know if you've ever used a matte filament, but it really does a good job of hiding the layer lines more than other filaments do. And sure, matte filaments and, and filaments filament is a little bit more expensive than normal, but the finish on your prints, the way that it looks, honestly, I feel it's well worth it. And there'll be a link in the description if you want to learn more about this filament. I got Cura set up. I started doing some slices, and the first thing that I sliced, of course, was one of my usual test models, my filament stress test model, and it came out absolutely beautiful. The details on this lion are great. The measurements are, well, actually pretty good measuring it right now. Yeah, within just 
a tenth of a millimeter. So a well calibrated machine right out of the box. So next thing I print, of course, were a couple of print blocks and I could tell that there was a little bit of over extrusion. They're fine. They work good. They're just a little bit tight to put together and a little bit tight to pull apart. Once you break them in, they're fine. Man, I really am loving this matte blue. The next thing that I decided to print was this TARDIS desk organizer, which I thought would go perfect with the matte blue and give me a place to store my calipers on my desk. I had to scale it up a little bit because it's an old model on Thingiverse and there were some very thin walls. Besides, I wanted it a little bit bigger, so that was a good choice. And again, it worked out okay. I still feel like there's a little bit of over extrusion, but you know what? Over extrusion might actually be a good thing for me because I'm still working on my future project for which my prints have to be watertight. So I switched out the matte blue for a little bit of transparent pet G from my friends at Yosu, which I mentioned in the last video. Unfortunately, that didn't go well at all and resulted in a couple of extreme failures. It actually filled up the little sleeve that goes around the extruder head. It's kind of cool, kind of pretty. At the same time, um, not what I was going for at all. Turns out the problem is that Pet G just doesn't want to stick to this build plate and so I'm gonna have to modify this build plate in the future. Jumping in here from the editing desk because I have to mention that the Yosu Pet G filament actually addresses this problem because in the box there is a spare build plate that will stick to the Pet G. So super points to Yosu for providing a, you know, branded solution to that. They also provide a spare nozzle and a little declogging wire, even though in I ran through the entire spool and I never needed to use a spare nozzle or a declogger. It never clogged on me. This stuff has been so far, and after running through a whole spool, which I don't always do, fantastic. So really happy with it. Though, I will say, this is a very specifically sized build plate and a specific nozzle. If you're not using a 3D printer that has this specific dimension and this specific nozzle, then this is an interesting extra expense, and it comes with every spool that they'll send you. I find this choice interesting. It's definitely a point of discussion. If you have any thoughts on the economics or otherwise about this subject, hit me up in the comments, but let's get back. Back to the matte blue, I decided, well, let's test this over extrusion. I'm going to 3D print one of these infinity fidget cubes, ones with all kinds of little embedded parts into it that if these things aren't allowed to be a little bit free floating, the cube will lock up and seize up and you'll break it when you try to use it. And as soon as I pulled it off the bed, just to have this failed example to show, ha oh, now I can calibrate it and make it work. I immediately started playing with it and it worked just fine. Genius. So yeah, while this printer might need to have a little bit of calibration and fortunately the calibration for it is super easy. I didn't need to do it for any of the prints that I was doing because <laughs> so far it's worked extremely well out of the box. If you didn't dive into this machine, it would still work for you. And that, that's just genius. I keep using that word. So besides the fact that they didn't put any test prints on the SD card or any filament in the box, there is one other small nitpick that I have to bring up that I only discovered because I was testing this printer just as a cold front hit the maker shed and lowered the temperature out here. See, the problem that I was running into was when I tried to level the bed, sometimes the x-axis would crash into the side and just go wop, 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 and sometimes the z-axis would crash into the bottom and go wop, 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 wop. and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. The end stop was triggering. It had a little light that showed up on it. I eventually figured it out. See, the cold is affecting these end stops. They're not 
just normal switches, they're inductive sensors. And I guess for some reason, the cold prevents them from working. So I just pulled out my heat gun, warmed them up just a little bit, and they started working just fine. But I also noticed that if I didn't let it warm up completely, that the bed would be off level and it would scratch the nozzle across the bed. You can see the ghost of Prince past on this bed because of it. And so maybe these inductive sensors also react differently within a range of cold. And I guess the lesson here is just don't use this 3D printer in a cold maker shed. And that's fine, but it does raise the question, what was wrong with switches? So you might be wondering, what is the ultimate fate of this 3D printer? Am I going to keep it? Well, it is a single nozzle, single material 3D printer of a build volume. Yeah, that I've got more than enough 3D printers covering that build volume. So I don't think I'll be keeping this. But, um, you know, I actually might have somebody. Hey, como esta? Bien, bien. Hey, I got a 3D printer you might like. No, this is a good one. This is the part where I hear nothing but hor, 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 as I get the microphone situated and my cable hitting. <laughs>